We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. During the middle of July, 1863, General Lee's bloodied Army of Northern Virginia limped back into Central Virginia, and the Army of the Potomac, despite President Lincoln's frustrations, let Lee's force escape. While those events in Virginia dominated the public's attention through the press, another Confederate force in Charleston, South Carolina, tried to hold off a powerful federal force from capturing the Cradle of the Rebellion. The Confederate general commanding that defense was the famous P.G.T. Beauregard, the hero of First Manassas and one of the South's best engineering officers and strategists. Dozens of miles of earthworks surrounded the northern and southern approaches into the Confederate city, but the greatest of efforts was directed along the southern approaches. Commanding one of those passages into the harbor was Fort Wagner, and it was deemed necessary to take this fort by direct assault. The officer assigned to lead the attack was Brigadier General George Strong, who would get his white regiments ready for this dubious offering, but would be joined by another, new to this theater of warfare, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. This regiment, raised in Massachusetts by Governor John Andrew, with the consultation of Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists, was the first Northern Black Regiment sent to the war. It was comprised of highly recruited individuals from several Northern states and was attended as a model regiment to demonstrate before the people of the country, Lincoln's administration, and the world. Its colonel was a wealthy young man by the name of Robert Gould Shaw, whose abolitionist parents were his inspiration. This was a regiment further comprised of highly skilled and highly educated colored men which included even Frederick Douglass's son, Lewis, who was appointed by Shaw as a sergeant major of the regiment, and he would be another key participant in the attack. The attack was ordered for July 18, 1863. The 54th, approximately 600 men, were split into halves, or a column of wings of the regiment. Shaw commanding in front, and Lieutenant Colonel Edward Hallowell commanding the rear wing. The left flank was nearly touching the marsh on the left, and the right nearly in the wake of the ocean. The attack rolled forward, and within a few hundred yards of the fort, the Confederate small arms and artillery combined to make the narrow land passage toward the fort a very difficult place to pass alive, let alone in a military formation. The 54th did not waver, and as the men were in the moat, Colonel Shaw, near his colors, launched up and upon the parapet where he was heard to call out, Come on, 54th! and fell immediately after. But his men were infused with his spirit and hurled themselves at the Confederate defenders. Bayonets and clubbed muskets were the weapons of choice in the sand parapets. The 54th, unsupported, could take but not hold the parapet. The brave black regiment begrudgingly gave way back out of the fort and held the dunes through darkness. The 54th's national colors were saved from capture by Sergeant William Carney, who despite being wounded in his leg, arm, chest, and face, crawled several hundred yards to safety, telling his comrades that the old flag never touched the ground and would eventually win the Medal of Honor. As far as the remainder of the regiment, they did, in fact, do the job that they were asked to do. But the cost was staggering, for the regiment lost 272 men killed, wounded, and missing, including Sergeant Major Douglas. Approximately 30 men were killed outright, and almost double that number would die of their wounds. The other regiment sustained significant casualties, and Fort Wagner was never taken. Months later, it was abandoned. 
Charleston would hold out until 1865. The summer of 1863 was indeed an active period of campaigning on all fronts. In the middle of the country, federal forces attempted to drive a wedge into the Confederacy through central Tennessee. This would first be realized in the little-known Tullahoma Campaign. The federal commander of the Army of the Cumberland, General William Rosecrans, looked to confront the Confederate Army of Tennessee under General Braxton Bragg and engage in a locked campaign to prevent more troops from the theater from going to help fight against Grant in Mississippi. It was, in fact, a brilliant campaign in which the Army of the Cumberland outflanked and pushed off Bragg's men from very strong defensive positions. It was a campaign that started an ongoing series of engagements in which this theme of Confederates who were strongly entrenched would be outmaneuvered by a federal army. During the late summer, Bragg was reinforced by the Army of Northern Virginia. In a harrowing series of train rides, General James Longstreet, with two divisions of his vaunted 1st Corps of Lee's Army, was sent to assist Bragg and other operations in eastern Tennessee and northern Georgia. This was a rare instance of the eastern and western armies shifting troops effectively, but it did give Bragg a slight numerical superiority and also a set of proven field commanders in Generals Hood and McClaws, who led those two divisions with Longstreet. The famed Texas Brigade was a part of that command, and one of those soldiers, J.B. Polly of the 4th Texas Infantry, would describe that ride in his memoirs. He wrote, at what date the Texas Brigade took the train at Richmond cannot be stated. It started and made the journey down to Georgia in unseated flats and boxcars. I slept on the floors and tops of these as best I could and subsisted on hardtack and uncooked bacon. Safe at Wilmington, North Carolina, where it stayed a day and a night and made its only change of train. It had no relief between Richmond and Atlanta for the constant joltings and springless freight cars running over roadbeds. Made it rough by consistent usage and seldom ever been repaired. The Great Battle of Chickamauga was opened on the morning of the 19th with a series of skirmishes around Reed's Bridge where it fell under the Federal Tactical Command of the 14th Corps, commanded by General George Thomas. This officer, a Virginian, was a loyal Unionist and a solid officer. At length, the enemy closed in upon us as if like a flame or a rushing tide, they would lap us up. They were on our right, front and rear, and we had to cut our way out the best we could. My losses were dreadful to contemplate, 750 men. Reinforcements came too late for my brave boys. They too were struck as a whirlwind and hurled into disorder. There were two days of epic, large-scale fighting with the Confederates pushing the Federals hard and Rosecrans boys buckled after a proud effort. Near the end of the fighting, General Rosecrans rode from the battle and into Chattanooga. He wanted to organize the troops who would be pouring into the town from the Chickamauga battlefield. He wanted Thomas to hold his ground, protect the road northward, and cover a retreat. Not only did Thomas perform this task, but his defense inflicted thousands of casualties into the late evening of the 20th. This performance would endure with a nickname for George Thomas, forever known as the Rock of Chickamauga. After darkness, the fighting died off, and within a few hours, Thomas had his plan for retreating put into effect. The Federals still would hold Chattanooga and would eventually draw on another fight outside the defenses of the city. This tactical victory was the greatest bloodshed in the Western theater, with over 34,000 combined casualties. The war was getting bloodier as both armies were getting better at killing on these battlefields. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.